trust that you have all been reading the book of Acts. And as I said right at the beginning itself, we are not going to go into every chapter. We're just going to pick up some uh, chapters where I feel it is important for us to see the whole setup of the early church. And uh, in, so that we can learn, we can learn from what the church was like, what it ought to be, what was the setup like, uh, how did they face situations, how did they face problems, how did they reach out to so many souls. And uh, we, want to, we want to try to, you know, pray that, that the Lord would once again revive the church and make it what it ought to be. Like I said at the beginning, you know, all of us have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as a church itself, as I look at the church today and look at the Bible and how the church was in the beginning, then I say, Lord, you know, please forgive us because I know that we have fallen far short of the glory of God. This is what the church ought to be like, a church that was literally controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit. Church was being built according to the way Jesus wanted it to be built. Remember, Jesus is building the church and the Holy Spirit has come. He says, I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will be doing what I, I will have to do only in, in a sense that he will be able to reach many more people around the world when Jesus was limited to a human body, where the, but the Holy Spirit is not limited in any way. And this is what we've got to pray. We've got to say, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when I pray, I say, now, Lord, I see you do so many things in, in countries like you know, the United States and Europe or England, you know, wherever it may be. But why don't we see moves like this happen here in Malaysia? And so we want to see a church arise in Malaysia. Not that we might say to everybody, hey, look at our church, but God, let your, the same spirit that built the church in the book of Acts and it's touching nations around the world, touch our nation as well. I'm not asking for a revival. I'm asking for the Lord to rebuild the church according to the way it is meant to be built. So with that in mind, we are coming back into the book of Acts. We are picking up different chapters where we can learn something. And uh, this evening, we're going to go into lesson number six. And uh, we need to look at the context. You know, when we were in Bible school, we used to have a saying, if you take a text out of its context, it becomes a pretext. So we, wanted, we want to look at the scripture. We want to look at the context in which it was written, why certain things were done the way it was done. And so this evening, we are going to go into Acts chapter five, uh, chapter 4, verses 5 through verse 11. And the, the topic basically is on effective preaching. Because if there was something that you will see throughout the Bible, uh, throughout the book of Acts, it is prayer, preaching, and the power of God accompanying the preaching. The Holy Spirit helping them uh, in, in the ministry of the Word. And that's what we need to see. We need to see prayer birth in our lives in the church. We need to see preaching according to the Scriptures, the, the kind of preaching they preached, uh, because we want to see the kind of results they had. So we've got to do the things according to how they did things, okay? So Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through verse 12, you can read it yourself, but this is where the whole context of our Bible study is for this evening. Now, we need to know that at this period of time, like I said, we need to look at the context. Now, there was the, in, in Israel, there was the Judean kingdom. They had a king. King Herod was the king at that time. And then later on, the different ones began to rule different Herods. Okay, there was Herod the Great, and then Herod his son uh, began to rule. Uh, and then this was the Judean kingdom. Now, besides Herod, as the king, they also had their governors or their leaders, and their leaders were basically from the temple. All right, the whole leadership of Israel was controlled by the temple, and of course, Herod wanted to please Rome and please the people, so he built the temple, but he was not really a very religious person, okay? He was not religious at all. So now, 
you have the Judean kingdom, and then you also you have the Roman kingdom, and Rome was basically the one ruling over Israel with a very strong hand. They were now tightening their grip on the on this tiny little nation. But at the same time, you know, there was also a rebellion going on, insurrection against the Roman uh, Empire. And in the midst of all of this, there was a ragtag group of people who are now introducing the third kingdom. So you have the Judean kingdom, you have the Roman kingdom. Of course, in the Judean kingdom, there were rebels, insurrectors who were trying to fight uh, Rome. And then you have uh, Judean kingdom, Roman uh, kingdom, and now you have the kingdom of God, this small group of people. But what was happening was powerful things began to take place. I mean, the Holy Spirit came in a very powerful way. That was the first miracle. They all began to speak in languages that they had never learned. Now, these uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 talks about the, the tongues of men and angels. It could have been languages known, languages unknown. But, that, the, but the second miracle was that everybody who heard them understood what they were saying. Now, this is in total opposition to uh, the book of Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 through verse 11, where the Lord said, we will go down. These people were building something that God was opposed to. They were trying to build, you know, a, a tower where they... That's what it basically means. You know, they were building a tower to worship, to reach the heavens simply means to get the heavens to rule over our lives. God was not pleased with this. So God came down and gave them tongues, but they did not understand each other. And so because they could not understand each other, they could not build what God was opposed to them building. Now, when you come to the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, how is it we hear them speaking in our language? In other words, they were speaking in, in different tongues, but the people understood what they were saying. Not necessarily were they speaking in the language that they were, you know, hearing, but it, the, the language was, you know, like, I, I, I speak Tamil, I, I will speak Tamil, and you who don't know Tamil at all understand what I'm saying. doesn't make sense. So the miracle was also in the understanding of the language that was spoken. So all of these things added up to, to a place, it came to a place where they were so uh, eager to hear, how, what is this all about? And that was the question they asked, what is this? And Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is a fulfillment of the prophecy. God said, I will pour out my spirit in the last days, result of which 3,000 people were added to the church. Now, of course, as they began to, uh, when, when people like this are just ushered out of Judaism, they all came to celebrate the Passover. They came to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They came to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And then <laughs> here the whole because and thousands of Jews, uh, converted Jews, you know, because they came from all different countries who had embraced Judaism. Thousands, 3,000 were added. And of course, this really upset the leaders. This really upset them tremendously. And so the two leaders, Peter and John, they were arrested and put in prison, asked to give an account. Now, in order to, for us to understand this a little bit, we need to go back also to Acts chapter 3. And in Acts chapter 3, you have the uh, beautiful gate miracle where the man is sitting at the gate, beautiful, and uh, he is begging and Peter and John come by and they say, silver and gold have we none. Now, they come at the hour of prayer. And I want to emphasize this. We must all have an hour of prayer. I don't mean to, uh, like, you know, 60 minutes. I'm talking about a season, a time of prayer each day. We must have that in our lives. You must put aside time for prayer. Don't say you don't have time. Please, don't say you don't have time. You have time to watch your series on, on TV. You have time, to, you know, if you look at your phone, your phone will tell you how much time you spent on it. We all have time. Everybody has been given 24 hours a day. We should learn to give God some specific time. Now, the Jews at that time, uh, although in the Torah it doesn't say that, the Torah covers the first five books of the Old Testament, all right, we, which we call the Pentateuch. So, in the Torah, it does not say 
that they had, uh, there, there's a particular time of prayer. But different individuals follow it. For example, David and Daniel, it says, you know, there were three times a day will I pray unto you. Three times a day Daniel prayed as he as was his custom. So they have the times of prayer. Now, when, when Peter and John go to the temple, it is the ninth hour. The ninth hour, if you read your Bible, it means 3 p.m. So the, the first time of prayer would be uh, the sixth hour, or sorry, the third hour, which is nine o'clock. Third hour is nine o'clock. Then you have 12 o'clock, which is the sixth hour. And then you have 3 p.m., which is the ninth hour. Now, how many of you know that 3 p.m. is not a very nice time <laughs> to pray because <laughs> it's hot? Uh, you, you feel a bit lazy, lethargic, of course, if you are, you know, if you're not working. If you are working, then that's that's a difficult time because it's in between your lunch and now it's almost time to go home. Uh, that's not the best time to pray. But they, they deliberately chose those times to pray. There's nothing specific. Uh, I mean, there's nothing special about those times, all right? It doesn't matter. But they had three, hour, three different seasons of prayer. So now... Peter and John go at the hour of prayer. By the way, the morning, 9 o'clock, and the evening, 3 o'clock, was the time they also offered their sacrifices. So there were those who were doing the religious thing, and there were those, Peter and John, who were going to do the right thing. It is not just the sacrifices. God said, I'm not pleased with, with the sacrifices. I'm pleased with you obeying me of you following after me that's what i'm pleased with so i pray that all of us will have that time so they come to the hour of prayer there is this man at the gate they raise him up they get him healed and then you know people get very upset about the whole the man getting healed the preacher peter starts preaching and of course when he's preaching he says you guys murdered the, the christ oh man they are livid they are they are so angry and then he goes on and he talks about, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. They were even more fierce. They, and they arrested these two guys and uh, threw them in prison. But damage had been done. 5,000 people were now added to the church. But then they ask the, the question. They ask the question. And this is the question. By what power and by what name, in Acts chapter 4, verse 7, have you done this? By what power and by what name? Have you done this? And so, you know, uh, now they said they're, they're about to preach Jesus. And that's what the book of Acts is all about. There is praying, there's preaching Jesus. They're preaching Jesus. In John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus said, If I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. If I am lifted up. Now, of course, he's referring to his crucifixion. But it is also a divine principle that as we lift Jesus, people are lifted up. That's why even in our worship, I always like to say, exalt Him. You know, on Sunday morning, one of the Sunday morning, uh, each Sunday morning, I will tell the worship leaders, you know, exalt Jesus, exalt His name, sing His name, exalt Him. When we exalt Him, people are drawn towards Him. Amen. You know, and, and it's great to sing songs of testimony that I can do this and God is with me and, you know, I, I am an overcomer and all these things are wonderful. But we need to sing songs of worship. Worship has to do with Him uh, and exalting Him. When I preach, I want to preach Jesus, you know, and that's, that's the emphasis they preached Jesus, Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, those who were scattered went everywhere, and wherever they went, they preached the word. Now, the, it does not just mean the gospel. When they say the word, it means Jesus. Jesus in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, John chapter 1, huh? and the word was God. All things were made by the word. Jesus is the word. So they went everywhere preaching the word, and the Lord confirmed the signs following. So in your notes right now, we come to point number one. We are told, firstly, of his personality. Verse 10, Let it be known to all of you and all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Uh, you you can try to kill him, but God raised him from the, you killed him. God raised him. Hallelujah! By him, this man is standing before you. Well, the man who got healed at the gate, beautiful, because of the name of Jesus Christ. All right. What? Why? Why was Peter so bold? 
Peter failed in verse 8. It says, Peter failed with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Without the Holy Spirit, Peter was a fierce, fearful person. Let's go back fishing, denying the Lord three times. But once the Holy Spirit came, see, that is why it is imperative for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, uh, Peter is now revealing the, the personality of Jesus. He uses a dwell name. And the dwell name is mentioned 256 times in the New Testament. It actually reveals the dwell nature of Jesus Christ. Now, we need to know that when Jesus was on the earth, he was 100% God and 100% man. You say, well, how can there be 200%? This is, this is what we call, you know, the divine mystery. Jesus, God in the flesh. And if a person denies that Jesus was God in the flesh, the Bible says, you know, uh, then he is like cursed or he is an infidel. He's an unbeliever. We must believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. However, he chose not to exercise his divine attributes, but depended as a man 100% upon the Father. The things that I say, they are not my own words, Jesus said. The things that I say, they are the words that my Father has given me to say. The things that I do, I do not do on my own. The Father has, is the one working in me. I am here to fulfill uh, the will of the Father. That's all. My meat, my food is to do the will of Him who called me and to finish that work. So Jesus was, although He was 100% God, he was still 100% man. So, first of all, this name reveals his humanity, the name of his humanity. He is called Jesus or Yahweh Jesus is Savior. And this is an Old Testament. Uh, in the Old Testament, you know, it, he's called Joshua. The word Joshua means he's my Savior. The name identifies him with humanity. could be said that this is the name that speaks of his humiliation. You know, in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Jesus being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, a man, of flesh, of man, servant. So, uh, uh, the, the word Jesus refers to his humanity. This name reminds us that he was a man. He can be touched by the feelings. He was tested in every place like as we are, yet without sin. And he can be touched by the feelings of our infirmity. He was a man of sorrow. Uh, the name was chosen for him by his heavenly father. The name was, he wore this name uh, and came into this world for this one purpose, so that he could die for our sins, right? God cannot die, yet men do die. So Jesus came in that sense, right? What a wonderful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. What a powerful name it is. We sing that song again and again, that at the name of Jesus, you know, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. What a wonderful name it is. So the, the name of his humanity and also in your notes, the name of his honor, Christ, the name means the anointed one. The name identifies Jesus as the Messiah, Malak HaMashiach. In the Old Testament, Malak HaMashiach, Ha means the, HaMashiach means the Messiah, Malak HaMashiach means the king is our Messiah, the, the king, he is the Messiah. So it, it speaks about the greatness of Christ, the honor, the man Jesus now, he is the Christ, the king, the anointed one. Another translation says the Messiah the, is the anointed king. Uh, and not just the king of Israel, but the king of the world. But according to the Jewish context, he's supposed to bring all the tribes of Israel together again and back to Israel again from all over the world. To, uh, he will bring them all back home as the Messiah. They were looking for a human Messiah. They did not expect God to come as the Messiah. They expected God to send the Messiah. And that's why they say somebody just like Moses, right? The scripture says, one just Moses shall come. So when they talk about one just like Moses, they expected a man. 
to come. But uh, this Messiah also will have to rebuild the temple. And that was the, the hope of every every Jew. They pray for the coming of the Messiah, hey, where he will rebuild the temple. But Jesus is more than the rebuilder of the temple. He is the fulfillment of the temple. He is the temple. He himself is the temple. Okay? And that's why, you know, he chased out all the money changers and he says, you know, destroy this temple himself and I will raise it up on the third day again. But also the Messiah would bring in the kingdom rule like David uh, of the of the lineage of David, according to the lineage of David. David was a godly uh, king in that sense, in a, a man who feared God, who really w- was a man after God's own heart, who established the kingdom, who loved his people like a shepherd loves his sheep. Uh, that's why God chose the shepherd boy to become a king. And Jesus said, I am uh, the good shepherd. All right. So that, that in that lineage, he is the king of all kings. I want you to understand that when Jesus was born, he was born and recognized almost immediately as king. The wise man came looking for a king, all right? And uh, he was a king. He reigned in life, not reigned over, but reigned in life. So although he was born poor, he did not uh, talk about his poverty. He was rich in many sense. He said, blessed are those who are uh, poor in spirit. They are Rich, yours is the kingdom of heaven. So uh, here, this the name Jesus Christ speaks of his, that dwell a nature that he had when he was on the earth. Peter was preaching this that he's not just the man that you saw and you killed. God raised him from the dead, gave him honor. Messiah, right? The second thing is we are told of his provision. Told of his provision. First of all, he made a payment. Peter reminds them of the death of this man named Jesus Christ. He came and he was crucified. He paid a penalty. There was a payment. Now, many don't understand. They think, they think that the world actually belongs to the devil. And so Jesus now came to buy us back from the... The world never ever was a belong to the devil, Okay. Uh, I, I remember sharing this illustration with you a long, long time ago. Uh, here is a young couple. The guy gets married, and then, you know, uh, they say they want to buy a house, so they've got enough money to make a down payment. They go buy a house. And so every month, the guy is now making payment. They said, can we do it? Yes, they can. They, every month, they save some money. They put aside. They go and uh, buy the house. But they've taken this big loan from the bank, right? Big loan. Monthly, they are paying back a certain amount of money. Now, along the way, after a couple of years or so, the young man goes to work. And on coming back, he notices a car. And he decides, okay, I want to buy the car. But he looks at his budget and and he says, I don't know whether I can squeeze this in or not. I think I can. And the salesman comes along. And by the time the salesman finishes talking to him, the man is absolutely convinced that he, without the car, he will die. (laughs) So he buys the car. He signs his name on the document. He makes the first payment. Goes back home, he drives the car back to his house. The wife sees the car. She's very upset because she knows that they cannot afford the car. (laughs) All right. Their budget is so tight. Oh, what are we going to do? They have a little bit of an argument. Then he says, come, 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 come sit in the car. Come sit in the car. Then she sits in the car. And she likes the color of the car, the color of the seat because it matches every dress that she has. Okay. So anyway, they take the car for a drive around. Oh, she's so pleased because a friend saw her wave and she waves at a friend, you know. (laughs) She's so happy. They they are so happy they got the car. So the first month, they pay the house. They pay the car. Second month, house, car. Third month, oh, man. Cannot make payment on both, so they pay for the car because if they don't, then the guy will come and tarik balik, okay? So they pay for the car. Then again, next month, never mind house, we can slowly pay back, we'll understand. Now, after some time, the bank sends a letter 
and uh, demands payment. And when they cannot make the payment, the bank forecloses on the deal and the house goes back to the bank. The salesman was an interruption. Just like the Garden of Eden, God owned the world. But a salesman came along and got them distracted. They bought into his lie. They bought the car. <laughs> Payment not made to the bank. So what happens? The banker is gone. God takes the property back. So the earth has always belonged to the Lord. And Jesus is the king, the king of everything. So now we are told that he makes the provision. He makes the payment, full payment to God, not to not to the devil. The devil owns nothing. So the payment was the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. Jesus makes the payment by his death on Calvary. I hope that at least clarifies certain things. Now, the second thing is he provided a proof. What was the proof? The proof was Jesus rose again. And he, P Peter is, is not so much as, uh, yeah, I mean, he's preaching it as a documented fact. He's not just saying, you know, I want you to know, uh, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, he rose from the dead. He, he is stating a documented fact. In other words, he's saying, prove me wrong. Get the body. Show me that he did not rise from the dead. I'm telling you that he rose from the dead. And that is why this man is healed. I've got no power to heal this person at the gate, beautiful. But, you know, he has been healed. How is this possible? Because God has given Jesus Christ a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, when I spoke into the man's lameness, at the name of Jesus, the man was cured. This is evidence. This is proof. Okay, And the third thing he does, uh, he provides this with a promise. Now, of course, he doesn't say this in his sermon, but Paul explains it in Colossians, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. He's called the first fruits from the dead, which simply means that if there's first fruits, that means there's more fruit to come. Okay, there's more fruit to come. So uh, we are told of his provisions. How? By the payment, by the proof, and in your notes, by the promise. He has made a promise. The, the death resurrection of Jesus is also a fulfillment of a promise because it means if he rose from the dead, then we also will rise with him. There's coming a day where we will rise with him. We do not know how to, we do not have to be afraid. I was just sharing the other day uh, with our cell group. And I talked about we must never be afraid uh, about passing on to the other side. See, the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now, if we are enjoying His presence as a present reality, then there should be no fear whatsoever of walking into the actual reality of Him being there, standing with Him and talking to Him. He now manifests His actual presence. Now we are feeling the sense of His presence. We know that He is around. We are saying, oh, the presence of God is so real. And, and sometimes when the presence of God comes down, it's so real, you want to spend more time. I mean, songs begin to come up in your heart. You start praising Him. You're worshiping Him. And, and you're speaking in a language that God has given to you. It's a glorious time. And you know, it's, it's like that. It's like I'm praying and I'm worshiping and I, and I just continue. But when I open my eyes, He's right there. It means that I pass from death to life. That's what dying is like. You can be lying on the bed and the presence of God comes for you and you're worshiping and you don't even know that you have died. The sting of death. See, there is a sting in death. There's a pain. There is, there, there is a, a struggle. But to the believer, there is no sting of death. We move on into the next world. We are afraid of it because we don't know what to expect. Like the prodigal son I shared with a cell group the other day. He's coming home. He does not know what to expect. Am I going to be a servant? I'm not worthy to be a servant. Lord, I, I've wasted my whole life. I've battled so many things. I've, I, I've squandered my life, basically. And now it's time to meet the Father. How do I go in? But the Father is waiting with open arms. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the anointing when I share this. There, there, the Father is waiting with open arms. He will embrace us, kiss us, 
ring on our finger. I mean, we don't need those things, but I'm saying there's such a welcome, there's such a celebration. Amen. So we should not be afraid of death whatsoever. Amen. All right. So now we are also told in number three of his power. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you. Well, he tells the Sanhedrin right here itself. He's saying, hey, listen, it is by his name that this crippled man has been healed through the power of the name of Jesus. And we have to be reminded that Jesus has the power to transform lives. Amen. Transform lives. How this crippled man has been totally transformed. I mean, we have seen as we pray in the name of Jesus. Now, remember, as I said before, ending a prayer in Jesus' name. I, I pray I must end in Jesus' name. If you read the book of Acts, sometimes they didn't even say in the name of Jesus. They just said, rise and be made whole. All right? Or, or they just touch healed. You don't find Peter praying for Dorcas and, and going, you know, the, it raised her from the dead. He, he just raised her, Tabitha, arise. He didn't say in the name of Jesus. You don't have to say it, you live it. Okay? I live in the name of Jesus Christ. My entire life is covered in the name of Jesus Christ. When demonic powers face me, they don't see me. My life is hidden in Christ, the Bible says. Okay, like where you sometimes you see me preaching, my, my notes are in my Bible. You see my Bible, but you don't see my notes. And so I am hidden in Christ. Uh, you know, my whole life is in Him. Amen. So when I speak, I'm speaking in the name of Jesus. I'm not speaking in my, in other words, I come with the authority of Jesus Christ. When you see a policeman, you know he demands respect from me. He does not have to say anything. You don't like the person, but because of the uniform he wears, I wear a uniform. And that uniform is Jesus Christ. Okay. So when I come in the name, I'm coming in the authority of Christ. That's what it means. So it is because of that name that I carry. Amen. The man is healed. Number four, here we are told of his preeminence. We are told in verses 11, verse 12, This Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So in your notes, he is the lofty Savior, L-O-F-T-Y. And Peter is basically quoting Psalm 118, verses 22 to 24. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our sight. The Lord has done it. This very day, let us rejoice today and be glad. He's making the case that Jesus is the Messiah. He's making the case that Jesus is the promised one. He's making the case that, that Jesus is the one whom God has exalted above all others. At his name, every knee shall bow. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, in everything he might have supremacy. Another translation says, in everything he might have the preeminence. Not just eminence, the preeminence. He must have it all. Amen. He must be the one exalted. So Philippians chapter 2, 9 through 11, God, therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus... Every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus' tongue is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is the lofty one. And of course, last of all, he is the lone Savior. Verse 12, there is salvation in no other, no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Notice the word, we must be saved. Not given a name among men by which they can be saved, but by which they must be saved. Men must be saved. And the only way they can be saved is when they call upon the name of Jesus. It's found only in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I trust that, that uh, we will 
remain faithful to this. I pray that God help me to remain faithful to this. Help me to declare Jesus in the way he is meant to be declared. Like I shared, you know, concerning the different people who receive miracles uh, in the Bible from Jesus, it always begins like this. And when they heard about Jesus, when they heard that Jesus was coming by, and they heard Jesus, you know, and when they listened to him, so it is, it is Jesus hearing about him. And I, I've uh, thrown this question, who told them? about Jesus, first question. Second question is, what is more important than uh, who told them is, what did they say about Jesus that caused them, that caused the woman with the issue of blood to risk everything, to start believing again? What caused her to start, although she had faced so many uh, qualified people, doctors, and now she hears about the carpenter, what does he know about sickness? But the way he was described to her caused her to say, I'm going to step out. And may each of us be able in such a way, may, may it be seen in our eyes when we talk about him. May there be a twinkle in our eyes, you know, like a person in love when they are speaking about the, their loved one. You can tell they are in love. When I share about Jesus, can people see that I am in love with him? When I sing songs of praise, can they see my face radiating with love for him? Lord, I want that to happen in my life, also in your life. Let's pray. So here we bow to lift you high. Jesus, be glorified in all things, in all of my life. Lord, be glorified, be magnified. God, I, we surrender to you. That song is such a powerful song. Here I bow before you, Lord, to lift you high. Right here, be glorified. Right here, right now, be magnified. So in my life, in all things in my life, Lord, be magnified. I want to magnify you. When I share you with people, may they sense that I love you deeply, Jesus. I pray this for all our people listening on in this uh, Bible study as well, that we will preach, not just uh, a preaching with words, but a preaching with our very lives, uh, with our very smiles, the look in our eyes. May we preach with our lives, Lord, the wonderful, wonderful person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the lesson tonight. I ask that you bless each one in a special way. We give you thanks, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed.